please note, today's episode was recorded before Evan Guskovich of the Wall Street Journal was sentenced to 16 years in prison by a Russian court. We will cover this in detail next week. I'm Francis Dernley, and this is Ukraine, the latest. Today, further to the usual military and political updates, off the back of the Blenheim summit, we assess the breaking news that Britain has granted the use of storm shadow missiles on Russian soil. Plus, we consider a new report as to why the Ukrainian counteroffensive failed and the significance of a story that a British soldier is fighting for Moscow. Bravery takes you through the most unimaginable hardships to finally reward you with victory. The first duty of my government is security and defence, to make clear our unshakable support of NATO and with our allies towards Ukraine. Keep stand strong. Nobody's going to break us. We're strong. We're Ukrainians. It's Friday, the 19th of July, two years and 151 days since the full-scale invasion began. And today I'm joined by the Managing Director of the Henry Jackson Society, Aliona Hlivko, freelance journalist Daniel Hardacre, and former tank commander Hamish de Breton Gordon. I began, however, by summarising the latest developments on the battlefield. Let's start in Crimea, where we're hearing more details of Ukrainian forces reportedly striking a Russian Coast Guard base in the occupied region the night before last, with Ukrainian outlets reporting that Kyiv's secret service, the SBU, conducted that naval and aerial drone strike during a Russian military exercise at a Coast Guard base near Lake Donalzav, damaging and disabling headquarters there with a control point, a warehouse, storing ammunition and equipment, and Russian firing positions. According to the Institute for the Study of War in Washington, Russian mill bloggers claim that the Russian 31st Air Force and Air Defense Division shot down 33 aerial drones, but debris from falling drones caused insignificant damage. To stress, we can't verify this at this stage, but the fact both sides are reporting activity is good evidence that there have been attacks. The main military report this morning, though, is that a Ukrainian drone allegedly struck a monastery in Russia's Kursk region today, killing one. That's coming from the regional governor there. The 60-year-old man is believed to have died after a drone fired eight projectiles at St. Nicholas Belgorodsky Monastery in Gornal, a village near the Ukrainian border. That's coming from Russian media reporting. Like other Russian border regions, Kursk comes under frequent attack from Kyiv's forces. It was only on Tuesday that a Ukrainian drone strike on a factory there producing electric devices caused a major fire. Now, in terms of the front lines, no major movements to report as yet. Russia is believed to have made a marginal advance north of Kharkiv city, but nothing substantial. The fighting there, though, continues to be fierce. Svetlana Moronets of The Spectator, who listeners will know from her regular appearances on the podcast, has written a dispatch from the front line, which we'll add a link to in the show notes. She quotes Alexander, a chief sergeant of the 36th Marine Brigade, who told her it's a miracle that the front line has held, with the delays in Western aid leading to Ukraine losing many more skilled and motivated soldiers than it should have. To quote him, our golden elite, whose wonderful men could have defeated the enemy, are now dead. While the weapons kept being delayed here, we are paying with the blood of our soldiers. If Ukraine falls, Russia will become far stronger because they will have absorbed us. And who then will stand to fight as we do now. The West's best hope of peace is to give us everything we need now. Otherwise, in five or seven years, the West will be fighting against me and my son. Sobering assessment there, I think. Now, speaking of Western failures, RUSI, the Royal United Services Institute, has just published an important report examining the causes of the failure of the Ukrainian counteroffensive in 2023. To avoid, it says, the repetition of such errors in the future and to inform the regeneration of offensive combat power of NATO militaries. Now, this is an extremely detailed report, so I'm only giving the key findings here as Jock Watling and other of its authors summarise. But if you're in more in if you want more detail, then I highly recommend that you read it. So 
They talk about the original concept of operations for the offensive was sound. It required 12 armoured and mechanised brigades to achieve a breakthrough along 30 kilometres of frontage, the isolation of Tokmak within seven days, and thereafter a breakthrough south of Melitopol. Tempo was supposed to prevent Russia from bringing the majority of its forces to bear, so that the attacking force would need to overcome only six regiments in defence. They continue, this concept of operation was not implemented. This arose from operational errors made by both Ukraine and its international partners, missing two critical decision points prior to the offensive. First, whereas Russia began to transition to a war economy from May 2022 and began the mobilisation of troops from the autumn, Ukraine's partners did not take significant steps to address their industrial limitations. Thus, while many nations gifted Ukraine a significant proportion of their national stocks, this did not amount to a sufficient volume of equipment to provide the doctrinal minimum of critical enablers required for the concept of operation to be executed. The second decision point missed was when that equipment needed to arrive in Ukraine. Ukraine's partners wasted four months in deciding to act so that only a part of the pledged equipment arrived in Ukraine prior to the offensive and the Ukrainian brigades did not have enough time to train on the equipment that did arrive. The brigades were, therefore, undertrained at the start of the offensive with accounts for a significant proportion of tactical mistakes made during the execution. Ukraine also made a series of errors. First, experienced troops were used to hold the line of contact and thereafter conduct fixing operations during the offensive, while the main force was for the most part newly raised. This left the lead elements with a dearth of combat experience which led to tactical errors during the execution of the operation. Second, Ukrainian planners exacerbated their shortage of properly equipped forces by committing troops on multiple axes, which were then further resourced with ammunition and enablers at the expense of the main effort. The combination of these two errors limited the ability of the force to operate at and maintain tempo. The most serious error made in planning by Ukraine appears to have been the basis on which it was determined that the main effort could succeed under these circumstances. Rather than using tempo and concentration to defeat six Russian regiments, it was hoped that shock action would cause Russian troops to break as had occurred around Kharkiv in 2022. Insufficient planning was done to assess how the critical conditions for such a collapse in morale could be achieved, so that this proved an overly optimistic planning assumption. In the event, the initial attacks failed and tempo was lost, such that Russia could fight the battle with the full 105,000 troops it had in the target sector. Operational security, it goes on to say, was not adequate, uh, such that Russia knew precisely where and approximately when the offence was to take place. As I say, the report then offers lessons as to what is required next time to prevent similar failure a highly recommended read for those especially interested in that question. Now, just a couple of other stories to wrap up this section. Ukraine is raising funds to build a new fleet of terrestrial robotic platforms that will roam the battlefield, delivering weapons, helping the wounded and fighting uh, with guns as well. Apparently, according to the Ministry of Digital Transformation of Ukraine, the new machines will be designed to act as mobile machine gun posts, logistic devices, tow trucks, mine layers and deminers, as well as self-destructive robots. To quote United24, the Ukrainian fundraising platform behind the initiative, they will fight alongside people and for people. The first robots are already proving their effectiveness on the battlefield and we hope there will be more of them soon. Yet another example of new technology being developed in this conflict, though, as ever, such developments are rarely game changers without the ability to produce them en masse. We've all seen how having lots of old weapons is proving more effective than fewer new ones. And in that regard, just one final story, which is that Russia's vast stocks of Soviet area weaponry is reportedly running out, says The Economist. In a detailed piece, it underscores how much of the weapons deployed in Ukraine are old, with, quote, the biggest emerging problem being with tanks and infantry fighting vehicles, which are crucial to any offensive ground operations at scale. Although it is estimated Russia may have had about 3,200 tanks in storage to draw on, 70% of them have not moved an inch since the beginning of the war. A large 
proportion of the T-72s have been stored uncovered since the early 90s and are probably in a very poor condition. At current rates of attrition, the piece goes on, Russian tank and infantry vehicle refurbishments from storage will reach a critical point of exhaustion. And unless something changes before the end of this year, Russian forces may have to adjust their posture to one that is much more defensive. No doubt Hamish will have some thoughts on that later. But before we turn to him, let's look at one more story covered by Telegraph freelance journalist Daniel Hardacre. Daniel, thank you very much for your time. Just to conclude this section for us, an interesting report that you've been working on. What is it? The story concerns a British national by the name of Ben Stimson, who is fighting for Russia, I believe in the Donetsk militia. And he, his association with the Ukrainian separatists goes back to 2015. And he has started a Telegram channel, which he started it in June. And this channel is essentially responding to demand about information on how to join the Kremlin's army. And he, po- he you know, posts a few different guides on how you can do that, how to avoid detention at UK airports, what to expect in Moscow, how long training takes, which is a month, according to Stimson. And that's, that's what he does. Interesting. And what did he himself have to say about this in terms of the experience? I mean, a month's training does not sound particularly long. What was his reasoning for doing this as well? That's what's quite interesting about it is he doesn't sell it as if it's some kind of a bed of roses. He seems to be responding to demand rather than giving a kind of inflated Kremlin line on what to do, which I think reflects his history with the Ukrainian separatists. I mean, he went in 2015, which in the war in the Donbass at that time was a very different thing to the invasion of 2022. I mean, that that war was essentially a question of what kind of Ukrainian statehood there was going to be. Was it going to be a singular nationalist one or was it going to be a pluralist one? And he described himself as ideologically motivated around that time. So he's not part of the sphere that sees the Kremlin as uh, antidote to the Western ills. Like, he's, he's not part of that. He doesn't do that too much. But he, yeah, he just gives a guide on how to do it and responds to people's questions. Uh, but there is a, a sort of slight ideological side to this, isn't there, in the sense that he is ex- you know, he supports people who express very anti-NATO views and uh, in terms of his political persuasion. And so there is a kind of underpinning to some degree, but you're right, it does feel like he's almost more of a mercenary than a hardcore flag-waving supporter of Putin. Yeah, um, I think so. I think he's one of the lost souls of 2014, 2015 that saw the conflict at that time as a kind of rerun of the Spanish Civil War. And he describes himself as a man of the left. He likes Jeremy Corbyn and George Galloway and also Nigel Farage as well. It's part of that. Anti-establishment. Exactly, exactly. And I think that he saw, as a few others did at the time, and there were other Western volunteers that went out there at the time on both sides, the ones that fought for the separatist militias, they saw it as a kind of global battle against establishment infrastructures and ideologies, really. And that's how he describes it. Did you get a sense when you were reporting on this of how many people have taken up this offer and also the way in which he's been utilised, perhaps, or not, by Moscow? Well, his channel at the minute has a a couple of hundred subscribers. It's not huge. So I imagine the take-up is not particularly great. I mean, if you want to join a uh, foreign army, I think the French Foreign Legion has a better pension scheme and that kind of thing. And there's not huge reports of legions of volunteers from the Anglosphere going to join Russia's army. However, there are videos that circulate online of Russian army recruits being trained in broken English. And I did manage to get in touch with a group called Interbrigada, who have long facilitated the foreign volunteers joining either either the Russian army or pro-Russian militias. And they didn't go in the piece because they didn't get back to me in time, but they said that they've been putting on English language training for a long time. So the demand is there. It's not huge demand, but people are interested. Mm. And it's, of course, interesting as well that we've gone quite a long way in how the conversation about British soldiers fighting for Ukraine or Russia has developed over the last two years because at one stage when Liz Truss was foreign secretary she was actually encouraging Mm. British men and women to go and fight for Ukraine and then that was very swiftly withdrawn and it does feel now that there is far more concern amongst Western politicians as to their civilians going over to serve in the Ukrainian ranks because of how some of those indeed people we've interviewed on the podcast were then used as 
bargaining chips in negotiations if they were captured by the Russians. And one would, it would be interesting to see what would happen in the other way around if Russians, I don't know of any Brits who have been captured by, uh, who've served in the Russian army. No, that's, that's a very interesting point. I mean, for one, it is technically illegal under the Foreign Enlistment Act, but it's a piece of legislation that is a little bit defunct. However, we saw it with Aidan Aslin, I believe is his name, when he was captured in Mariupol fighting for the Ukrainians who became a Russian propaganda chip for a while. They've videoed him singing the Russian national anthem. And yeah, you would wonder what would happen if that was the other way around. But the amount of people that have fought for the Ukrainian side is obviously much higher than that of the other side. Well, Daniel, thank you very, very much for your time and for reporting on this story. And we'll have a link to it in the show notes to the episode. Now, before I turn to Aliona and later Hamish. Let's just unpick some of the geopolitical updates of the past 24 hours. A major summit, of course, taking place in Britain at the moment, the uh, Blenheim Palace Summit, as it's become known, where 45 European leaders arrived yesterday, birthplace of Winston Churchill, of course. We don't yet know whether any substantial agreements were made behind closed doors. The rhetoric was what one would expect, given the setting, with the new British Prime Minister Keir Starmer promising to face down aggression on this continent together because of the threat Russia reaches right across Europe. And there's also Prime Minister of Poland, Donald Tusk, warning that Europe was in a pre-war era. So much of the same kind of rhetoric. But there has been criticism that given the situation in the US, Europe is fiddling while Kyiv burns, as it were, we could soon be on our own. But a sense of urgency measured in action it still seems quite hard to find. Macron has apparently been neutered by the result of the election in France. And while the words of leaders at this summit and others are strong, it does feel that little is fundamentally shifting despite the new reality across the pond. Now, Zelensky is still here in Britain and is only about a 20 minute walk away from where we're talking to you now, where he's addressing the cabinet at number 10 Downing Street, the first leader to do so since Bill Clinton in 1997. As part of that, John Healy, the new defence secretary, has announced that the UK does intend to allow Ukraine to use storm shadow missiles for defensive strikes on targets inside Russia. So that uncertainty that we've discussed at length on the podcast in the past week or so does appear now to have been cast to one side. They will be able to use the weapons, which no doubt the Ukrainians will find welcome. Britain will also provide military aid to Kyiv every year for the rest of the decade, Healy has said. No doubt another subject of conversation in that cabinet meeting with Zelensky is the US stance. Were Trump to win the presidency, as he's now widely expected to do so, and then, of course, as we've discussed, compel Kiev to the negotiating table. Yet, and I'd be very interested to hear Leona's perspective on this shortly, what feels to me underappreciated is that the Ukrainians are still seemingly inclined to fight on even without US support, at least in the short term. Indeed, Zelensky has just said, when reflecting on Trump's idea of ending the war in 24 hours, that if the main point is the loss of territories as a result, we will never go for it and no one in the world will force us to do it. So he's not mincing his words. Now, interestingly, we are hearing that Trump will have his first phone conversation with President Zelensky since the war began later today. Nothing else has come out from it, but nonetheless, suffice to say, a very significant development indeed. And it'll be fascinating to see what, if any, movement comes from that. Now, if one tri- if Trump wins, as I say, one can easily foresee a situation where certain European countries decide to commit perhaps more to Kyiv because its survival is seen as vital for their own. The shift in Poland and Estonia, for instance, is quite stark, where people are already thinking in terms of a future war that might break out in the next few years and how that might impact their life plans. And I only mention that to just give you a sense of how different the feeling is about the pressure at the moment from different European capitals. 
Now, relevant to this, of course, is that Ursula von der Leyen has just won a second term as the European Commission's president, pledging to build a European air shield, her term, as part of an overhauled defence strategy within the bloc. She's pitching herself as a safe pair of hands who can strengthen the EU against the threat posed by Russia and guide it through the war in the Middle East and, of course, a return potentially of Donald Trump to the White House. Now, a key part of her strategy is to develop this true European Defence Union with flagship projects of defence and cyber security. But... Surprise, surprise, the scheme is likely to be met with opposition from NATO allies that are already working on separate air defence projects. So under her plans, EU member states will probably be asked to commit to purchasing a single system built on the continent, such as the Franco-Italian SAMPT or SAMPT. But many are asking, is that wise? Is that the most flexible and effective approach where you've got everything controlled from the centre? Does that have security vulnerabilities? Is it not better to buy more effective weapons from abroad, to have more adaptive strategies? And so we return to that central question about what is the best means of Europe to defend itself? Is it separate sovereign states operating independently? Or or is there a time now for there to be a more collective, centralised effort? It seems that Ursula von der Leyen is now favouring the latter, but many will still pursue the former. And of course, relevant to this too, is that Kremlin officials are continuing to expand their geographic scope in terms of talking about a Eurasian security architecture. The Russian Foreign Minister, Sergei Lavrov, is claiming at a press conference at the UN yesterday that Russia and China are advocating within the Shanghai Cooperation Organization, the Association of Southeast Asian Nations and the Gulf Cooperation Council for the creation of this new Eurasian security architecture. And Beijing in particular has been much more provocative than many have recognised during the NATO summit period. So very interesting that too in the context of these Western conversations taking place at the moment. We'll get to that matter shortly. But first, Aliona, it's great to have you. What were your thoughts, first of all, on the Blenheim summit, one that does seem to be quite significant, although perhaps not as much as some were hoping? Great to be here, Francis. Uh, Thank you for having me again. Indeed, Blenheim Palace Summit was an interesting one because I think it's signaled just that Britain was scrambling through a lot of international engagements that were planned back to back for the new government to attend, for the new government to prepare to, and just to get a a grasp of everything that's going on. Frankly, I was quite surprised when Rishi Sunak announced the elections for the 4th of July, and that meant that he would be skipping the NATO summit, a historical NATO summit, the European Political Community Summit, which um, is taking rotation across Europe. Um, And it was Britain's great chance to put itself again back on the map uh, in Europe. And he just gave that up to Labour. And I'm sure that it was quite a challenge and a struggle to get up to speed with things. Now, first of all, there was a major document that was in preparation to be signed at the European Political Community Summit planned by the Conservative government. I believe it was a first idea voiced by Lord Cameron when he was Secretary of Foreign Affairs, uh, he offered to sign a 100-year partnership between the UK and Ukraine. And that is the document that was being prepared for many months. Um, I um, consulted um, the Foreign Office on several occasions and what the agreement should include, which um, are the areas where the two countries could cooperate the most. Um, It would basically be expanding the strategic partnership agreement signed between the UK and Ukraine in 2020, just uh, as the pandemic was coming in and there was no sign of second invasion. So it was quite symbolic that now they wanted to expand that agreement in all areas, including trade, tariffs, culture exchanges, healthcare, and not just defense, but defense would be a major part of it, and sharing of information on the new tech that's evolving in Ukraine every day on drone usage, all of those areas. So I know that that was a big document that was in preparation, but of course, I'm sure that as soon as Labour government came in, they wanted to see what's being planned. And as far as I heard from civil servants, they wanted to postpone it to either work on it more and sign it during Keir Starmer's first visit to Ukraine. 
which is rumored to be held in August, but we shall wait and see, uh, or maybe sometime later this year. But I hope that that document is still coming along. Now, I think that's why maybe it almost looked like a vacuum uh, in terms of anything substantial reached in Ukraine. But several things uh, that were strongly on the agenda, and I think that came out as success, because even yesterday when I talked about the European political community, what kind of summit it is, what is the importance of Zelensky being there, and what does it mean for him to travel to the UK yet again under the new government, I was being asked questions, okay, Sir Keir Starmer is talking about allowing Ukraine to hit targets in Russia, and then his own Ministry of Defense is then denying his claim. So what does it tell us about the government and what actually their policy is? So that is something I had to refer to as misalignment, probably, and the lack of that one single agreement, perhaps relying on some other NATO allies that are not fully in agreement with that. So if that has shifted, as you reported from today's meeting, then that would be one of the great wins for Ukraine, because UK has obviously been at the forefront with the previous government of supporting Ukraine and setting the tone for Europe and the United States in supporting Ukraine. So it's important to keep that trajectory and keep that pace up, just like the UK did with tanks and then fighter jet coalition, even though it never ended up providing a single jet, but still the initiative was born here. So it's important to keep that up with uh, hitting the targets inside of Russia because that is where all the missiles and all the uh, malign fighter jets are lifting off from. So if they could be intersected as they just go up in air, it would save so many lives in Ukraine that the situation will be vastly different with all the civilian casualties. That's the number one goal of Ukraine needing that access. Just a a rather cruel question to to spring on you, but how deep in Russia are some of those bases? Because, of course, the range here is really relevant. Storm shadows and this supposed green light that's been given, they have a much further range than many other missiles and, of course, drones that have been seen as being very effective. So, you know, is this a big step? Would this mean British weapons going very far into Russia or are they actually still fairly close relatively terms to the Ukraine border? I believe that the range will now allow to go way deeper into territory, maybe even up to the Ural Mountains, so even way beyond Europe. Some of the airfields that Russia is using against Ukraine are even in the Far East. That is, of course, part of Russian military infrastructure. Ukraine is reaching that far through its own various means, including intelligence, some insurgencies, special operations. But we do need that game changer in terms of long range. I'm not sure perhaps you heard of exact range because storm shadows do vary in their reach. And depending, of course, how many of those missiles we're getting, because that's number two on the agenda for the Ukraine, first being allowed to use them and then the consistent supply of these weapons. So I think that should be a a game changer if that is sustained. And then maybe, hopefully, the US will follow, Germany will follow. Taurus is something strongly on the agenda coming from Germany. I know that hopefully the future government could be a bit more decisive about that. They have elections next year coming up, and it seems like center-right forces, CDU, will come back into power, and they're the ones advocating strongly for sending Ukraine towards missiles, probably rectifying for Angela Merkel's mistakes, but they do have that strong uh, united vision for Europe. And coming back to Britain and the EPC summit, another important message, or I guess mission, that President Zelensky had when he came here is, of course, the membership in Joint Expeditionary Force that the UK is leading. So for those listeners who perhaps don't know, but I'm sure that listening to your podcast, everyone is well informed now, Joint Expeditionary Force is is a union of 10 NATO and non-NATO member states of Northern Europe, really effective, first of all, economies and then military powers in naval sphere. And the Joint Expeditionary Force, its main goal is to expedite forces where they're needed. So why Ukraine wants to be part of that, even though it's not technically Northern Europe. First of all, it's a UK-led alliance. Second of all, the standard of operations is extremely high. And all of the members, in fact, in this alliance in Northern Europe are strong supporters of Ukraine. It's If you look at Norway, Denmark, the Baltic states, they do and have done so much for Ukraine already. And uh, that the main decision, of course, needs to be made here in London. 
and why Ukraine needs to be a member there is because that will bring us one step closer to what's been discussed at the NATO summit, interoperability. So NATO membership for Ukraine is not just you know getting under the umbrella of NATO and making other countries fight Ukraine's war. It's about making sure that the militaries are aligned, that our equipment is aligned, that our processes and standards and the way the wars are being fought, the way our operations are being conducted, logistics, communications, that everything works together. And what's a better way to do that than start working within Jeff? That's, again, run by the UK, so it has a a solid power to make that decision here uh, and bring Ukraine closer with its defense operations, not just to learn uh, the Western standards and Western way, but bring the plethora of knowledge and experience that it has gained so far in these two years of extremely intensive war on European soil. Really interesting getting into some of the granular details of this behind the headlines. I'm just... Thinking more pessimistically, Eleonora, if I may, you talk there about those powers that are doing more for Ukraine. And as I was saying earlier on, there are some who would say that given the context of the United States, Europe more broadly is not doing enough. So let's imagine, therefore, that Trump does win the presidency in November and does as the worst case scenario, which may not be the most likely scenario, but the worst case scenario is a quite substantial withdrawal of support for Ukraine. What then happens, in your view? What does Ukraine do? Does Ukraine, to the point earlier that Zelensky said publicly, fight on with the support of its allies like Britain and like those countries you've just described? Or does it really feel obliged to get into ceasefire territory, negotiation territory, because it has no choice? I mean, do you see a split forming? Where are we heading? Mm, First of all, no split in Ukraine. That would be a solid no from Ukraine in terms of ceasefire. Just that word, and and I'm sure that I'm speaking here for the whole of Ukrainian nation, the word ceasefire invokes some kind of allergic reaction just because we had so many consequences. The thousands of civilian lives we're losing now are because of the ceasefire that was reached in 2014-2015 with Germany, France, Russia at negotiation stable. So that is just something that's completely untenable. When we look at Trump, especially his recent uh, developments, the Republican convention, I think I was holding my breath almost, not rushing to any conclusions because I was waiting to see who his uh, vice president nominee would be. And seeing J.D. Vance coming in, I think that almost tarnished my hopes for some sanity in Trump's campaign when it comes to foreign policy, when it comes to battling isolationism and the nativism and protectionism that United States sometimes gets ill with um, almost and, and infected by. So unfortunately, I don't have too much hope there. Seeing Nikki Haley endorse Trump, I think, A, it was almost like a Spanish embarrassment seeing what she said about him before and then completely reversing and and supporting him. But hey, we see that in politics all the time. At the end of the day, J.D. Vance was the one who called um, Trump Hitler. I hope that maybe she did that to get a position of Secretary of State. And then Europe still has some hope because her stance, which hopefully will not change as much as her political stance, could be good for Europe. But I think you're on to a very important point there, that as the United States have split over Ukraine, that huge wave of isolationism and of a, I think it's fair to say, a right-wing administration that's uh, nearing closer to far right in its isolation tendencies and you know America first and all of that, that it might trigger similar reaction in Europe. Now, many European allies don't have the luxury to just go cold on, on Ukraine and on Europe because the threat is too close. America can do that. It's overseas for them. They can claim it has no impact uh, on the U.S., whatever is happening in Europe. But history has proven that to be wrong many times. Maybe they need to learn that lesson again. Um, But many European allies will have to face the reality. Many intelligences from European states are still continuously saying that Russia could be ready to attack Europe by 2027. Boris Pistorius, German Minister of Defense, said it himself. Polish intelligence is saying the same. Baltics are getting prepared for war. 
I hear extremely troubling reports from Eastern European allies who are saying that it's not just about getting ready for America to take a step back and having an obligation to raise their defense spending to 2% over 2%. Poland will hit 5% next year, and that's the highest in the alliance. That's quite unprecedented. And yes, they are gearing up for war, buying up uh, stocks of weapons from South Korea now because the U.S. can no longer provide with their obligations. The more troubling thing I'm hearing, and that is something that I will be writing for The Telegraph this weekend, is that Eastern European allies are seriously considering of getting nuclear deterrent themselves. Because right now, Europe is relying on the United States, not just because of its uh, huge weapon industry, because of geopolitical forces and, and power. It has got several European deterrents altogether. France's which is not dedicated to NATO per se, so that will have to come on bilateral basis or EU basis. The United Kingdom, whose nuclear power is all in submarines and it is effective to an extent but only to a certain extent given the various reports that have come out about preparedness for war in the UK and then there's the US so Eastern Europe naturally is beginning to ask and that is something that Ukraine has warned about since 2014 when Budapest Memorandum was violated blatantly. Budapest Memorandum was signed in 1994 when Ukraine gave up its third largest nuclear, nuclear arsenal in the world, signed by Russia, the United Kingdom, United States, guaranteeing security for Ukraine if it's giving up its nuclear weapons. We did that. And now we're talking about should Ukraine seize its territories and give up its sovereignty and uh, everything else. European states looking at that, countries like Poland, Baltic states and some others are thinking, right, so if we don't have the U.S. backing us, if we don't have enough time to get ready military-wise to prepare the capacities, if we have to face the nuclear power on the other end, the aggressor, Russia, then it's clear we need our own nuclear deterrent. And I hear some of the so far just conversations about those eastern states uniting and getting their own nuclear deterrent. And that's going to be a huge and unprecedented step towards proliferation, all because of this isolationism coming from the United States. It is fascinating. And of course, it's not going to be just on that nuclear question. It's going to be more broadly about just conventional defence. And I think it is going to be very interesting in the worst case scenarios. I don't want to sound too pessimistic here. This may not be the most realistic scenario, but it is the worst case scenario, which we have to plan for, right? That Ukraine is left more on its own with the United States withdrawing, some other countries being more cautious. And then it will be up to the Baltics and other nations to potentially for their own defence, not just for Ukraine's ideological sustainment, but just for their own defence and realpolitik will feel the need to get involved. And that, as you say, comes with certain risks. But Alia, just one more question before going to Hamish on some of these themes we've talked about today so far. In that piece you referenced, which we'll try and publish before the end of today if we can, so that listeners can read it and we'll have a link in the show notes. You also talk quite eloquently about the threat of China and how people have missed a lot of the activities that China was engaged with during the NATO summit, joint military exercises with Russia and indeed in Belarus. Can you just talk a little bit more about that and what you think its implications are? I found it quite fascinating and to be honest, troubling that the news, it was mentioned somewhere, but no one really rang the the bells, which I think they should have. Obviously, there was a huge media show in D.C. talking about Washington summit and 75 year anniversary. But at the same time, China goes off and puts on military drills with Belarus. And Belarus is de facto a province of Russia now on the border of NATO, and that's the country that was used in weaponization of migrants for the first time. That's when this new hybrid warfare tool was used. Belarus has supported Russia in invasion of Ukraine from the north. And when previously China has only dared to hold some joint military drills with Russia and other of its 
partners in Asia, Far East, South China Sea, and they were mostly aimed at fighting and holding off some social uprising, insurgencies, various land operations, sometimes maritime airspace operations. But the closer they got to Europe was maritime drills in Baltic Sea in 2017. And now they're going as far as, as Brest, which is several kilometers away from Poland, literally holding military drills on the NATO border at the time of its summit, eastern border of NATO that is under biggest threat from Russia now. And we are seeing maneuvers conducted by P- by China's PLA. So what does that say? What kind of signal does that send to the West, to NATO itself, and to Europe? Is China now effectively stating that it's a party to war in Europe It's clearly chosen its side, despite all of the last year's charm offensive and trips to Europe, even though the trips were apart from France to Hungary and Serbia. But still, I think that needs to be looked at very closely because China still claims that it's not a party to war. It calls for peace. It's supposedly not supplying Russia with weapons. And at the same time, it's holding military maneuvers on the NATO border at the time of its summit. Fascinating. Well, thank you very much, Aliona, for that. And now it's time to come to our very own Hamish de Breton Gordon. Hamish, you've written quite a lot for us this week on a myriad of subjects. Where do you want to start for us? Well, good afternoon, everybody. And you know, absolutely fascinating stuff coming out there. And just before I go on to that, I mean, the nuclear issue, I think, is a really strange uh, area and dynamic. And I wonder if when Britain does its strategic defence review that started now, that we look at whether we have enough and the right type of nuclear deterrence. One thing missing, obviously, is battlefield nuclear weapons, which Russia has in abundance, and nobody really apart from the Americans have. So absolutely fascinating. But let's go on to some sort of what is the the sort of tactical battle, if you like. And I don't want to recover any ground that we've already covered today and perhaps this week. But um, certainly the piece I wrote earlier on was the the Trump-Vance piece, uh, and the implications that might have and the potential that we have a very challenging four months up until November, because, uh, as you said, Trump's going to sort it out in 24 hours. And Vance was the main person holding up the 60 billion of U.S. support to Ukraine that was delayed for months and months. And I think he's been quoted as saying he really doesn't see what what effect Ukraine has on U.S. defense. So there's an awful lot of stuff being talked about at the moment and whether both Trump and Vance say what they're saying now in November we shall wait and see but I think the other area really looking down at the tactical level there's a very good piece written in the paper yesterday about Putin repositioning air defense assets which on the face of it was interesting but actually if you dig deeper and really tying in with a piece you wrote earlier on this week Francis about the fact that the Russians can't sustain the casualties that they're taking ad infinitum. And we talked earlier about how Russia was trying to ramp up its defence industry. It's got to get all the tanks out of storage. I I saw T-55 tanks on trains this week. This is a tank that was built in 1946, really showing the scrape in the barrel. But my point is, and really going back to your Peace, Francis, on on how long Russia can sustain from a manpower perspective is you can't do everything. You can't lose three to six hundred thousand troops on the battlefield and also build thousands of tanks a month. There is a finite area here. So I think going back to the piece about the air defence assets, I think it says an awful lot about the state of the war and. A lot of casual observers, I'm sure not those people who listen to the pod every day, and and people I speak to, again, who are not intimately involved in it, seem to think that that Russia is very much in the ascendancy uh, and, you know, they're making progress. But actually, when you start to look at the detail, I think you realise that that's probably not the case. And if we take the Kharkiv offensive that Russia threw everything at, you know, Ukraine held and pushed them back. One interesting thing is, I think one of the main reasons that Ukraine was successful there was in that area of northeastern Ukraine and that area of Russia that abuts it, Ukraine was given the ability to fire Western missiles in that area to take out 
Russian assets. And I think that had a huge impact. So the point that we're learning really on the hoof at the moment, that it would appear that the British government have now said that Zelensky can fire Storm Shadow and other UK missiles into Russia is is hugely significant. I think when you look at the next thing about the manpower, and again, highlighting your piece, the challenge that the Russians have, and earlier on in the pod, we were talking about Russian soldiers getting a month's training before going to the front line. That that just is not enough, except to train somebody to fire a rifle, clean a rifle, and sit in a trench. And that is one of the key reasons what now why, why the Russian front line is static, because they've got soldiers there who know little except to fire a rifle and get out of the trench and walk forward. And you will have heard Dom and I talk about manoeuvre warfare, combined arms manoeuvre warfare. In order to do that warfare, you need a lot of training. There's a lot of coordination, a lot you've got to learn about it. So that is a key issue. And from a tank perspective, when I commanded the first Royal Tank Regiment, it took us a year to train us to be able to do that sort of stuff. Tank crews are getting little more than a few weeks, which again is why they are used in a very basic sort of fashion. We look at the air defence assets. The story yesterday and the piece that I've written in the paper today is about Putin redeploying very scarce air defence assets to protect mainly his palace north of Moscow. Because I think as the Institute for the Study of War, the American think tank, has said, basically the Russians are repositioning air defence assets, so scarce assets, for high-value targets or high-value defensive areas. So Putin's palace in Moscow and his palace in Sochi are taking up a huge amount of air defence assets. And to me, it's a little bit of a ruse of war because one of the explanations for this is that the Russian, the uh, Ukrainian Secret Service said in January when they flew a drone to attack a, an oil refinery north of Moscow, they flew it right over um, Putin's palace. Uh, and that might have be, be persuaded him to do that. So when we look at it, you've got very scarce air defence assets that are not protecting troops on the front line, probably not protecting some key military airfields and command centres, which we now know are, are in play, to use that sort of vernacular, but they're protecting Putin's castles and, and, and palaces. So very, very significant indeed. So I think although we're at a sort of stalemate at, at the moment, and we have this four month up till November sort of figure in our mind, what can be done? And I absolutely, do, I think Zelensky has said today, there is no ceasefire negotiation over territory. And Russia currently, I believe, hold about 20% of Ukrainian territory. So that is not going to be negotiated. But what can Ukraine do when we actually think the Russian military are on the uppers? They are hanging on. And it's interesting that the summit that we've been talking about, I love, you know, what one of the best quotes came out of it, I, I think it's either from the Dutch or, or the Danish prime minister, quoting Churchill in his birthplace, saying, it's not enough to do our best. Sometimes we have to do what's required. And hopefully that will stimulate the other European leaders and the rest of Europe to really support Ukraine as much as it can, because the situation could significantly change come November if, as threatened, America just withdraws support. But I put if in in inverted commas there. Other things that are coming online are, are, of course, other air assets like the F-16. So it's an interesting piece, but I, I think the balance or the pendulum is swinging towards Ukraine, and it's up to the rest of us to make sure that swing is much more pronounced to, to enable them. So yeah, an awful lot happening for Francis at the moment, and no doubt will over the next few months and weeks. But I think the most important thing I've heard today is that the UK is going to allow uh, Zelensky and the Ukrainians to use those smart weapons into Russia. And that could have a really significant impact on how Russia conducts this war going forward. Well, thank you very much, Hamish. And interesting what you were saying there about the length of time for you to train for the kind of operations, given that Rusi report that I mentioned earlier on, which talked about training deficiencies in the Ukrainian army. And indeed, we don't ever talk about 
to your point, training deficiencies in the Russian army. And perhaps that explains why their offensive capabilities are also restricted just in the way that the Ukrainians were last year. Coming up, Aliona, Daniel and Hamish offer their final thoughts. Dan, you've heard a lot today. You've sat here very patiently. What are your final thoughts? First of all, probably don't join the Russian army if you value your life. And secondly, I think on the topic of the missiles, whether that's the storm shadows or the attackums, the US ones, one thing that gets a little bit overlooked with that is the effect that, that will have inside Russia and how that weighs with the tactical advantages that it gives Ukraine. I mean, there's a strong tendency in Russian culture to when they feel externally threatened, to put differences aside and circle the wagons. And if you speak to people inside Russia, and I think Medusa as well, the independent Russian outlet, did a piece on this a few months ago about how people in Russia that were and remain anti the war, they become, they are becoming more aware of the consequences if they lose and becoming more suspicious of the West. Now, if you want to defeat Putin, it will be beneficial to have those people on side. That's an interesting point. Thank you very much. Aliona. Thank you, Francis. The uh, situation in the world is getting a little bit more dangerous every day. Unfortunately, the inconsistencies with elections across the world this year did not help. We anticipated that. We discussed that going into 2024 uh, on the podcast that that will have its effect. I think the great start to tackling those challenges is the strategic review uh, starting with understanding that there is the new axis of evil that's formed with Iran, Russia, North Korea, and now China. As we've discussed, China that is factually becoming party to war and threatening NATO on its border uh, during its summit while everyone is away, it's come to Europe. I think it's quite troubling that they are now seeking beyond all the initiatives that China already has to move away from this bipolar into multipolar world is that they're trying to create some kind of Eurasian security cooperation that you've mentioned at the beginning of podcast. All of these challenges are only signaling and underscoring one thing, something that European allies were saying at the NATO summit, that interconnectedness of Euro-Atlantic and Indo-Pacific theatres is undeniable. It needs to be looked at cohesively. And hopefully that the new Labour government will take on its role of bringing America to its senses, keeping it in Europe, being that bridge between the EU, the new European Defence Force, the conflicts between NATO allies and EU members, something you touched upon as well. And we shall wait and see how the US will act, because that is right now a wild card that we can only wait and see until November what's going to happen. Well, thank you very much. Aliona, Daniel, Hamish, you've got the final words today. Thank you. Uh, just two final words. I, I, I was going to update on the, the chemical weapons issue. I think it was covered that the uh, Ukraine government put a report to the United Nations, the Organization for the Prohibition of Chemical Weapons, de- detailing 3,200 uses in the war and over 600 uses in the last um, four weeks or so. It's having a tremendous effect. When I was investigating the use of chemical weapons in Syria over an eight-year period, we discovered about 200. So it just shows you the scale of the use of chemical weapons. And that is something that, that we should deal with. But my final thought really is I was delighted to hear the UK Defence Secretary, the new one, John Healy, say today that the defence of the United Kingdom starts in Ukraine. And when we look at the strategic defence review that was announced again this week as well. My my concern is that it's not going to drop, it's not going to report until the middle of next year when we could be in a very, very different defence and security structure within Europe. And we know a lot of what is lacking in the British military at the moment. And hopefully with the the vigour that the new Labour Party are putting, Labour Labour government are putting into everything they're doing, I, I would hope that they get on, start writing the the shortcomings of the British military. But absolutely fundamental to our security is what happens in Ukraine. And uh, we must do everything we can to enable the Ukrainians to prevail. Ukraine The Latest is an original podcast from The Telegraph. 
To support our work and to stay on top of all of our Ukraine news, analysis and dispatches from the ground, please subscribe to The Telegraph. You can get your first three months for just £1 at www.telegraph.co.uk slash Ukraine, the latest. Or sign up to Dispatches, our foreign affairs newsletter, bringing stories from our award-winning foreign correspondents straight to your inbox. We also have a Ukraine live blog on our website where you can follow updates as they come in throughout the day, including insights from regular contributors to this podcast. We also do the same for other breaking international stories. You can listen to this conversation live at 1pm London time each weekday on Twitter Spaces. Follow The Telegraph on Twitter so that you don't miss it. To our listeners on YouTube, please note that due to issues beyond our control, there is sometimes a delay between broadcast and upload. So if you want to hear Ukraine the latest as soon as it's released, do please refer to podcast apps. If you appreciated this podcast, please consider following Ukraine the latest on your preferred podcast app and leave us a review as it really helps others find the show. Please also share it to those who may not be aware we exist. As the disinformation war ramps up, we are relying on your support more than ever. You can also get in touch directly to ask questions or give comments by emailing ukrainepod at telegraph.co.uk. We do continue to read every message. You can also contact us directly on X, formerly known as Twitter. You'll find our handles in the description for this episode. As ever, we're especially interested to hear where you're listening from around the world. Ukraine The Latest was today produced by Giles Gear. Executive producers are David Knowles and Louisa Wells. With special thanks to Rachel Porter.